Hi there. Welcome to Hope Lutheran Church. Welcome to our sermon study for this week. This week we're talking about, again, the four things that we sometimes lose track on. Sometimes we forget to do. Sometimes questions fill us. Sometimes these four things change us. Because God has a lot to say about these four things. This week, we're talking about anxiety. Do you deal with anxiety? Then this is the sermon for you. Do you know someone that deals with anxiety? Then this is the message they need to hear. Come, let's hear what God has to say about anxiety. Well, welcome to episode number two on this sermon series where we're asking if there is a better path for us to go down with some of life's issues. Last week we talked about anger. And like I said at the beginning, I know where I want to go with my anger. I know where this, wor this world wants me to go with my anger. But as we saw, there are many ways, six ways, that God has shown us a better way to handle with anger. Today we're going to talk about something that is very serious for a lot of us. Something that has changed in maybe the past 20 years and shown itself to be something that is real and something that is really in our lives for many of us, and that is anxiety. Now, when I was growing up, anxiety, that was synonymous with, you know, being nervous. I've got anxiety. That's another way of saying I was nervous or I'm worrying. But over time, we have realized and research has shown us that anxiety it's more than just, you know, worrying if it's going to snow next week or, or being worried that the roads might be slippery this week. Anxiety is something that changes our body. It affects, us, it affects our body. It affects our nervous system. It affects our breathing. It affects, gives us heart palpitations. Anxiety is something that seems to sometimes take over our body and fill us with worry and fill us with the unknown. Now, if you have anxiety... If you know somebody that has anxiety, I can tell you that you are definitely not alone. And that's why this is worthy of our study. I saw something that said that there is an estimated 20% of all Americans, 20% that suffer from anxiety. Not just worrying about if it's going to rain next week, but actual anxiety where it affects their presence, it affects their body, it affects their soul. 20%, that's one in five. That means that as we look, Take a look and just count every fifth person. It's most likely that that amount of people in here are dealing with anxiety right now. If that's one of you, if you know somebody that deals with anxiety that's in your mission field, well, again, you're not alone. You have people, huge moguls like Oprah Winfrey. She deals with anxiety. She has admitted that. You have Adele, the famous singer. She deals with crippling anxiety, she admits. You have, if you're into, into uh, baseball, Joey Votto, an all-star player, one of the best players of our generation, deals with crippling anxiety. And King David even dealt with anxiety from the psalm that we just read. So you are definitely not alone. And I sort of want to take the stigma off of you that if you have anxiety, you are definitely not alone. You are with people right now in this room. You're watching online, streaming with people right now that deals with it as well. And is worthy then of our study because I know where I want to go with anxiety. I know where the world wants me to go with anxiety, but God has things to say to us about anxiety. He has a path and we're going to see five different things today that we can do to help us with anxiety. Now, a couple things, a couple things I can't speak to. I cannot come up here and I cannot tell you what triggers anxiety for you because each one of us is different, and I'm not a trained psychiatrist. I cannot do that. Perhaps a trained psychiatrist can tell you what triggers it specifically for you. I cannot come up here and I cannot tell you if medication will help, or a different medication will help, or what kind of medication or dose. I'm not a licensed doctor, so I can't speak to medication either. I can tell you though, I may not know everything about anxiety, but I can tell you where it all comes from. It all boils down to two things. If you're a note taker, here's where you're going to want to fill in your first blanks. Anxiety. It is based on two things. 
It is based on fear, and it is based on what-ifs. Anxiety is caused when you have the fear of the future. You have the fear that something that happened to you in the past is going to happen again. You have the fear of when it happens again, what are, is going to, what are people going to think? You have a fear that something is going to happen and you're not going to be able to handle it. You have a fear that you are ill-prepared if it does come and it will change your whole life. What if I lose my job? What if, for, for me, what if I'm no longer a pastor? What is that going to do with my family? What if I lose my, what if I hear it's cancer and I go into the doctor? And so it gives me anxiety. What happens if I can't pay uh, my bills next year? What if this whole supply chain problem is going to hit my house? And with that, we don't know the future. We don't know, it leads us to fear because we're filled with what ifs. What if this happens? I don't have the answer, so it creates anxiety. So I can't tell you about medication. I cannot tell you about what triggers it for you. But I can tell you and show you that it is based on fear and it goes to what if. And with it, it then leads us to spiritual questions. Because when we have anxiety and when we are filled with questions and what ifs and what's going to happen, we take them to the Lord, right? Like we just heard with the kids. We take them to the Lord. And when he doesn't answer, we start making conclusions. God is not on his throne anymore. God has put uh, his ringer to silent for me, and he's not listening. God has put my messages to, um, you know, to voicemail, and he's no longer talking with me. God is off doing something else with someone else because he cares more about someone else than he cares about me. And with that, our anxiety grows. And so this is a worthy topic for all of us to listen to because not only does anxiety affect us, but it affects our loved ones. It affects more people than we probably think. So let's go down the path. Let's go down the path to find out not what the world wants us to do, not what we think we should do. Let's go down the path to hear what God would have us do as we struggle with, as we deal with, as we love people who have anxiety. And I want to take you to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, 1 Peter is a wonderful book of the Bible. Like last week, it is one of those cheesecake books of the Bible. And what I mean by that is you can't just, you can't just gobble down cheesecake. You, it's, meant to, you, it's meant to be savored, right? You take a bite, you savor it. You take another bite and you enjoy it. This is one of those books of the Bible that you almost want to read one sentence, stop, and enjoy it. And take another sentence, stop, and enjoy it. And so there are five things that we're going to see today things that God would have us do um, when it comes to anxiety. And it's great to hear because we're going to be going to a letter that Peter wrote to a church, or to people that are scattered. And this is how he starts out his letter. And I just want you to set the scene and just think about what life must have been like. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. This is after Jesus has ascended into heaven. We are now getting uh, the people that have been around Jesus a little older, and there's a next generation coming. Christianity is not illegal yet, but boy, there is a lot of pressure to renounce your faith. And there's a sure a lot of pressure for you to stop going to church. And there sure is a lot of pressure to rid Christianity of the earth. By this time, the Romans have driven out the Christians from Jerusalem. And what do Christians do when they're on the run? Well, they settle in different places. Now imagine that for a moment. Imagine that we were in a world where it was illegal to worship. And here comes the authorities, and they scatter us. They either throw me in jail or they kill me. Uh, they either throw my family in jail or kill them. And you guys are scattered. Gone are your homes. Gone are your families. Gone are your Christmas uh, traditions. Gone are your schools. Gone are all the things that you look forward to because you're now on the run, all because of your faith. So Peter is writing to people under a terrible amount of stress. Anxiety may not be a word that they fully recognize that we do now, but they will have gone through anxiety. This is how he starts his letter. He says, Peter, there's your, your um, author, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So I have authority. You should listen to what I have to say. To the God's elect. That's you. That, that's them. Those are Christians. People that God elected. People that God chose 
for no reason besides grace, God's elected, those people that are strangers in this world because their home is in heaven. Jesus won that for them. But these same Christians that are now scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. These people probably would have come from somewhere in Jerusalem and would have been now on the move. With that, like I said, new families, new neighborhoods, new customs, new languages, all on the move because of their faith. And so you can probably understand what they're going through when it comes to anxiety. Over, di- over uh, two do- dozen times in the book of Peter, God, or Peter uses the word suffering. And it's just to remind them and us that even though we're Christians, it doesn't mean our life is easy. Just because we're Christians and we're adopted children of God doesn't mean that we have an easy life with no problems. In fact, the closer you are to Jesus, sometimes the harder it is on this world. The more you fly your Christian flag, the more grief you might get. So just because you're one of God's elect, just because your home is in heaven, doesn't mean that your life is going to be easy. And that's one of the things that Peter is bringing out in this entire book. But when it comes to anxiety and stress and worry and depression, he gives us a path. It's a good reminder that God not only shows us a path, but he is happy to show us a path. If you suffer from anxiety, God still loves you. If you know people that suffer from anxiety and stress, that does not define you. That does not take away the badge that God put on you that said, child of God, redeemed and perfect in my sight. That does not take that away. God, though, is showing us a better way to handle anxiety and a better way to handle stress. Five ways. So let's go and we're going to look like this cheesecake uh, uh, section of scripture. We're going to take a verse, we're going to savor it, and go on and find five ways that uh, God has given us to help with our anxiety. The first one he says, as we go to chapter 5, he says, first way, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. You know what that means? That means that turn your attention to God. When you feel anxiety taking over, when you have an anxiety attack, that's when you turn your attention to God. That's when you look to God for help. That's when, like that haunted house, you hide and you grapple and you hang on to your your heavenly father. What doesn't that mean? Because he says, what does he say? He may lift you up in due time. He doesn't say immediately. So when you go and you ask God for help one time, you say, well, I tried that, pastor, and he's not answering. You don't know the plans that you have for God. God may give you different ways. While we go and we say, Lord, take away this anxiety from me. Get rid of these panic attacks that I have. God may send you a friend. He may give you the opportunity for you to go and speak to a licensed therapist, to go and talk to a counselor, to talk to a pastor, to talk to a doctor, to use medication. So just because God isn't answering the way you want doesn't mean that God won't answer. In fact, he will answer. He will answer in due time. So therefore, humble yourselves. Trust God that he is going to act in your life. When you are suffering from anxiety, when you're suffering from panic, trust that God will help in due time by giving you the answer. You may not be looking for that answer, but he will respond and give you help. Number two, Peter says, you want to deal with this. Cast all your anxiety onto him because he cares for you. That word in Greek, cast, it's not just tossing. It is what you do if, uh, you know, imagine that you have to throw your garbage. All of us have garbage uh, when the garbage trucks come by. Nowadays, we have it where the garbage trucks will actually take your garbage from you, pour it in, you have, don't have to do anything. Imagine, though, this week, the garbage man says, well, uh, for some reason that crane doesn't work, I'm going to need you to toss your garbage into my truck. What would that look like? You would take your garbage and you'd start swinging, right? And swing and you'd give it a grunt, and you would throw it up there, and it would hopefully land in it, and he drives away. That's the word that Peter uses. Take your cares and throw them. Throw them onto your Lord. Don't just place them 
where you remember where they are so you can go grab them and take them and put them on your lap again. Take them and throw them away from you. God does not mind hearing your problems. God is not disappointed with the things that cause you stress. God is not ashamed. God is not bored with the issues going on in your life. In fact, he welcomes them. Put them onto him. His shoulders are big enough. He is God and we are not. He wants you to take it, throw it, and walk away just like we would if that garbage truck comes up this week and says, hey guys, um, you got to throw it in there for me. That's what God wants you to do with the stresses in your life. Those things that cause you anxiety, throw them. Put them onto someone that can help. Because Jesus can help because Jesus is God and he cares for you. God is not expecting you to do this alone. God is not expecting you to handle it. Let God be God. Number three says, be self-controlled. Now is it not the time for you to turn away and do whatever you want. When you are suffering from anxiety, when you're suffering from worry, that does not give you the right to disobey God. There are many times when I've heard people, and it's easy for us to say, well, you know, I started drinking because of all the bad things happening in my life. You know, um, I, I, I took it out on my wife. I was pretty abusive to her because of all the things going on at work. It doesn't give us the right to do that. God is not saying, because you are going through a stressful time, that means you get to disobey me. You need to now, more than ever, be self-controlled. Remember when Jesus was out in the desert and he was being tempted by Satan. When did Satan come and talk to him? When he's at his weakest. Satan is going to want to talk to you when you are at your weakest to try to get you to disobey God, to ignore God, to start thinking, where is that God of yours? Now more than ever, when you're suffering, when you are going through this trial, now more than ever is time to follow what God would have you do. Be self-controlled. In addition to that, number four, be self-controlled. Be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now is the time that Satan is going to try to pull you away, especially if you are having panics, if you are anxiety, if you're anxious about things, if you're worried, if you're stressed, that's when Satan is going to come and try and pull you away. He's going to try to pull you away like a roaring lion. Now, more than ever, is a time that we need to stay close and hear again who our Father is as we walk through this valley, like we sometimes walk through a haunted house. More on that in a second. And finally, the fifth one. As Satan is prowling around, resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. There's that temptation. Satan is going to come to you saying, you're all alone in this. You are all alone. God is not answering you. God's phone is on silent. God is dealing with other people who seem much cleaner than you. God does not care. God does not have the time. God, you have disappointed God. All these things are going to... And what Peter is saying is, you're not alone. God is right there with you. We're going to talk about that in a second, too. But what he's saying is, you've got brothers and sisters in Christ dealing with stresses in their life. If you have anxiety, you are not alone. You are sitting amongst people today who have had it. You are sitting amongst people today who, like you, are chosen children, who get to look forward to heaven like you. Which leads us to the source. Where can we look to for joy, where can we look to for strength? And Peter finishes out this by saying this. And the grace of, uh, and the God of all grace, that's our Lord, the one has given, who has given you grace, the one who has said, you know what, I'm going to judge you and your life on what my son has done, not what you have done. God of all grace, who called you, who called you of all people to his eternal glory. He wants to spend eternity with you you. That's how much he cares about you. That's how much he loves you. Who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ after having suffered a little while. If you're circling words, a little while. The stress you're going on through now, I'm not saying is small, insignificant, or silly, but there's going to be a time period to it. There's going to be a day when this is in the past. There's going to be a day when the things that you are stressed out over now are going to be gone. Because God is going to allow you to go through this 
for a time. God is going to put a book stop on how long he is asking you to go through this valley. As long, after you have suffered a little while, he's going to do four things. He's going to restore you. There's going to be a time when you are going to be new, when you're not going to have stresses or anxiety. The Lord is going to make you strong. Even though we feel weak, there will be a day that he makes us and changes us so we are strong, so that we are firm, not wobbly, so we get back up on our feet again, so we stand again as, as, uh, as warriors for Christ and steadfast, meaning that we can rest easy. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Okay, let's turn this now to us. Let's, uh, I, want you, I wanted you to leave here because I know that this affects many of you. Um, I want you to leave here with some tools in your hand. The first tool is possibly in your hand, literally. If you have your worship folder on you, there is on the page that you usually take notes for our small groups and for further study, there's a bunch of passages. The next time you feel anxious, the next time you feel overwhelmed, the next time you feel like it is too much, the next time you might be having a panic attack, I want you to go and I want you just to fill in and read those passages. Just take one and write down what that means for you. Every one of them will give you hope and give you joy and remind you or even teach you about what God thinks of you, especially as you are going through anxiety. So there is your lifeline. Take that home. Keep it nearby. The next time you feel it come upon you, the next time you feel overwhelmed and you can't do it, pull it out, look up the passage, and savor it. If you need it more, go to the next one and savor it. Hear what God has done for you. That's a way that you can stay close. Because as we are going through issues, there are things that we can do that our friends and people can do to help us. We can talk to people. Feel free to talk to me. You can talk to licensed therapists. You can talk to psychiatrists. You can talk to doctors. Perhaps medication is something that is useful for you. But the first thing and the biggest thing you're going to want to do is stay close to your Lord. And the best way to do that is to stay in his word and especially hear what he has done for you. How he sent Jesus for you. How he sent a Savior for you and didn't leave you abandoned. How that Savior did everything for you so that you can stand with him forever and ever in heaven. Nothing that we have done. Everything that Jesus did for us. If also, if you're taking notes, I want to leave you with these things that I want to leave you with. Seven things. Seven things I just want to remind you of. Let this be seven seeds that grow inside of you this week and create joy to help disband and dispel the anxieties that grow. Here's the first one. When you don't know what to do this week, remember, God is always with you as your guide. Second one, when you're hurting, when you are hurting this week, remember who Jesus is. Remember God is with you as your comforter. When you're struggling, struggling to make ends meet, struggling to find answers as leaders of your home, when people depend on you and you're struggling, remember God is with you. He is your great provider. When you feel all alone, Remember that you have Jesus not only as your Savior, not only as your example, but Jesus is your friend. God created a bond of peace with you, and you now are friends with God. When you're afraid, remember that you have a refuge, you have a castle, you have a mighty fortress, Jesus, to hide behind, to be protected by, to be feel safe and secure in. When you're feeling dead, when you're feeling regret, when you're feeling that your past is creeping up, remember that you have a Savior. You have a Savior that is judging you on what he did, not on what you did. And finally, especially as we are going into the Christmas season, remember that Jesus is your Emmanuel, God with us. You have a God that is with you in all times, especially when you're hurting, especially when you feel panic, especially when you are anxious. Anxiety doesn't define you. If you suffer from anxiety, that it has not disqualified you. In fact, you know that through this, God is going to stand by you closer and closer, all the way until 
He brings you home to heaven where there is no more pain, when there is no more panic, when there's no more anxiety, because Jesus has made that all for you. Amen. Let's go to our Lord. Let's speak to him in prayer. Lord, we live in a sin-filled world filled with stress. And so we come to you with our anxieties and issues. Send us help for those of us who need it. Send us calm today, if you wish. But like you have promised, give us the strength to hang on for a little while. We look forward to the day when all of our problems are in the past and our eternity is with you forever. Amen. Hi there. I'd just like to take a moment, just you and me, to talk about one of the ways that you can respond to what you have just heard God do for you. There are many ways that we can respond, and maybe the most effective way that you can respond right now, today, is by giving a monetary offering to God through hope. When you give to God through hope, you are giving to over 20 different ministries. Ministries that change people's lives here in Farmington or in the region, in Minnesota, even around the world. And I just want to take a moment just to talk about that very fact for a moment. How can you affect people around the world? How can you change people's lives, people that are living around the world? Well, you can do it through what you're doing right now, and that is technology. You see, the things that we do for technology we know that we are touching people in Europe, we're touching people in Australia, we're touching people in Asia, not to mention people all around our continent. And we do that through technology. So I can assure you that when you give to God through hope, one of the things that you're supporting is people hearing that timeless truths that come only from God through the media called technology. So your offerings, your gifts, are touching people all around the world. Thank you for giving in the past. If you haven't given a gift, maybe today's the day that you give a gift. A gift that you can either have reoccurring or a one-time gift. For those of you that have given in the past, thank you for your generosity. It was an honor serving you. Thanks for worshiping with us. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. Otherwise, as always, because of Jesus, you have hope.